Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. So today I'm delighted to be joined by Junie, Gina, Gina Samuels. Welcome to the show, Gina. Looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you, Simon. Looking forward as well. Yeah. So um, Gina and I were just having a, a, a quick chat before I hit record. And um, I, I, and I asked a question and, and you said, Gina, that you've, you've, you've never felt that you were in the fog. Yes, I think so. I think this is a really important um, adoption relevant concept that has sort of taken hold for a lot of people. And I think it is important. So I don't want to undermine for folks for whom that was and is a really critical moment of their growing up and experiencing adoption. Um, what I'm about to say isn't to undermine that. I do think that that is really important and real critical sort of concept that that has been useful to help people to understand phases of their life as an adopted person. But what I was saying is that for me, that I, being raised by someone who was so open and out about being adopted, my mom was so very comfortable about talking about that. I never felt that talking about adoption somehow undermined our relationship or our closeness. And I also think being a black transracially adopted person, that's not, it's unusual to have that be part of a, a privilege that you get to be in the fog, you know, like it, our family are everywhere where we went, it was very out, people would come up to us unsolicited and ask how we all went together. Um, so I think also a feature of where I grew up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, didn't allow our family to be in any kind of fog whatsoever because constantly um, we were, it was brought to our attention that we were different and it required um, all of us to have to sort of whether we liked it or not, be accountable to our, our differences um, constantly. And I think having then the gift of a mom who was confident about being able to talk about that and not feel insecure herself, allowed my mom and I to be able to talk about these things and allowed me not to feel like I was hurting her feelings by asking questions or that our relationship was ever under any kind of risk to be able to talk about questions that I had or confusions that I might have had or feelings that I might have had about white people, um, feelings that I did have about white people growing up and how they were um, showing up in my life in a, in a way that oftentimes um, was paired with racial trauma. Yeah. I didn't ever feel like she felt um, un, unable or unwilling to be there with me in that, in that hurt and that anger that I, that I had gone through. So yeah, yeah that wasn't a, that wasn't a part of my growing up. It's sort of like, as far as I can remember, I've been on panels and discussions talking about transracial adoption and having to sort of deal with that as my different phases in age um, unfolded. Yeah. So uh, do, do you see these two things as, um, well, let me, let me just back up a bit and this is how kind of like my theory on trauma like it's it's like a it's like a, a sandwich mm. uh, of layers so you know you've got at, at the bottom you've got um perhaps you've got some generational trauma mm -hmm. then above that there's a what people call the primal wound and, and then um above that sometimes the, there's some trauma that people have been through uh, as as they're growing up and then on on top of that, you, you, there's maybe a, a transracial um, angle where people feel they don't fit in, um, transracial adoptees feel they don't fit in, and also see they don't see that don't fit in. So that kind of reinforces it. And, and then you've got uh, also kind of like a, a, cult, a, a an international or a cultural uh, layer. To, so mm -hmm. that's kind of how I. That's my view mm. of the of the trauma. It's like a layer mm -hmm. cake, mm -hmm. um, and and some of those, as a as a white guy adopted by white parents, I don't have that uh, transracial ad adoption um, trauma angle. Sounds like you didn't have it um, either, but for some people, it's quite a quite a thick layer. Um, uh, so how how does your how does that stack up with your take of? Mm. Uh, yeah, so I wouldn't say that I didn't have transracial adoption trauma. I certainly oh. did. You know, I, I think I think it um, and I like the idea of the layer cake. I might as you were talking about, it, I was thinking, what would I what food would I uh, kind of use as a metaphor? And I think it's sometimes it is a layer cake like that. And I think other times it's like a smoothie where it's all blended up together and it's very difficult 
to separate it out. So, you know, like as a transracially adopted person who of color, it's very difficult for me to explain how separate being a black person in society is. You know, like my experiences when I talk to black people sometimes are no different than people who are adopted versus not adopted. You know, like I experience racism and yeah. Um, and that's no different than any other black person who had experienced racism. However, I experienced that racism in the context of having a white mother, um, in the context of being taken to Oshkosh, Wisconsin. How much is, of that is about my transracial adoption? Well, some of it isn't at all related. It's very much like being a mixed race person who has a white mother who, um, you know, but it's different in that I don't also have a black side of my family that I could, you know, go to. How much of my racial trauma is related to being a mixed race person, you know, and what that's like being in a white context versus when I go into a black context. And so it's very difficult to separate these things out of like what was about being transracially adopted. Well, you know, what's being like being transracially adopted is when I'm around black people and people want to know why do I talk this way or why don't I have a secret family recipe for sweet potato pie, you know, or, you know, those are all those racial traumas that are losses that I have because of transracial adoption and um, and they look different for different people um, and they come up at different times in life, um, but that they are they're absolutely there and I, I would dispute anybody arguing that you don't experience the trauma, how that manifests in your life is very different for all of us. And for some of us, that is the way we frame the traumas that we experience or the hurts or the losses, it gets framed as transracial adoption. But as a researcher, I might pick that apart and say, well, some of that stuff you would have experienced anyway, even if you weren't transracially adopted. And some of that stuff you might have experienced um, in your own biological family as a function of being a person of color. But for those of us who are adopted, because we, we are absent oftentimes a lot of our own information, it's very hard to sort of recreate that layer cake and say, oh, well, 20% of it is about just being a person of color. 20% of it is about having grown up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And my experience was very similar to other people of color there who were not transracially adopted. Um, and, and so it's really hard to yeah. tease to tease that out and fragment that out um, because we exist as the smoothie. <laughs> it's all kind of you know in us, um, and and because we oftentimes lack so much information, we're left to sort of make meaning of it and label it um, as it makes sense to us, which is completely valid to do. But um, when you step back from it, and when I do as a as a researcher, when I'm talking to other people. Um, I have the benefit of not being in the smoothie experience of it and can kind of say and more of a layer cake kind of thing. Well, well, yeah. well, you probably would have, you know, some of this might have happened anyway. You know, like I would have had a white mom anyway, even if I wouldn't have been adopted. So, hmm, you know, yeah. a different white mom, a different white mom, but a, but a white mom. But I also would have had a black dad, which is different. You know, um, and I are already would have had a proximity to whiteness already because I'm mixed race. So as I've gotten older, I've been able to sort of go back into my life. If you would have talked to me at five, I would have attributed everything I experienced to being transracially adopted, everything. Um, but now I can, you know, kind of be a little bit more nuanced in terms of understanding uh, what what part of my hurts and pains were about transracial adoption, what part of those were about being mixed race, what part of those were about being black, um, what part of those would be about being in a single parent family, about being raised in Oshkosh, about, you know, and so I think it's really hard to say what you did or didn't experience and what part of this was about trauma uh, related to a adoption period, and then about transracial adoption period, and then about being black and transracially adopted, and then about being mixed race and transracially adopted and black. There's yeah. just so much complexity there. Um, so, but I absolutely would say that I have, that I live with uh, the trauma of transracial adoption all the time, you know, and trying to explain what my experience is and people's politics about transracial adoption and therefore who I am and who my mom is and assumptions about that, that I constantly am having to, you know, attend to or choose not to. Yeah, of course. I um, yeah, I, I love your smoothie. I, I love your smoothie metaphor, uh, and I, I think um, the 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 layerings out of this is totally artificial. 
actually. It's far more, um, it's far more, um, you know, it's impossible to separate out these different stuff. These different stuff. Only somebody it, it who's not hard. living it can separate it out, which I think is helpful. I think it's, I think the layer cake is helpful, but I think the lived experience of it is probably more messy. Yes. Yes. I, I agree. I think it's only, it, it's an artificial, it, it, it's an artificial uh, layering, separating stuff out um, because uh, uh, f f for to discuss it only as a means of, of discussing it, yeah, to separate yeah. the stuff out. Uh, yeah, your, your my, my stuff is artificial and your stuff is, is truth. So um, how does this manifest for you kind of internally? Because there's, a, um, I'm, I'm looking really about, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand how you have felt about it, how you've, how, how, how this has been for you, your lived experience. How has that felt? What's that felt like to you internally rather than, because you've got all this external stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, and interesting, I think there's a British, British racism is different to American racism. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever been to the, to, mm -hmm. yes, to I have. the UK. Yeah. It <laughs> seems to be different to me mm -hmm. as, a, as a white guy. Uh -huh. That might be white privilege, me seeing it different, mm -hmm. who knows? But it's just how I, how, and how would you say it's different? How do you feel it's different? Um, well, I think that um, it's probably, well, if you look at it, there's not many, we were involved in the mm -hmm. slave trade, right? We were architects of the slave trade, the British um, yep. The Americans and the Africans were, uh, were 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 all together, but the 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 slaves went like not I physically think, like, like there. It wasn't a physical presence in your. It, it, it's not in, in, in the UK. Um, most people uh, there's so there's some wind there's the Windrush generation, which is the people that came back from, you know, what British people would call the colonies, what you know, call the empire. Um, for, so it came from the you know Afro Caribbean, from, 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 they they kind of came back, um, but with the this we ha we haven't had um, this the the same layer of uh, division. We haven't had apartheid. You had apartheid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somebody told me yesterday they were in a they were driving down a, a road in Alabama, and there was two different churches opposite each other both both of the same dom denomination so both mm -hmm. both baptist both wensleyan yeah. or both lutheran or whatever they were and somebody said well why are the two and so one's, <laughs> one's, one's black white. and one's white yeah and so we we do have um our our apartheid is more cultural than political less than, than political so i live in a very white area Mm -hmm. right? If I see a black person in, in the town where I grew up, I know that they're probably there to work, right? It's because most of the Afro-Caribbean and black people live in, a, in, in, a in, in, in an urban, in, mm -hmm. in, in, in Leeds, right? So, um, so it's, uh, yeah, it, 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 but you had this separation. So the, 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 we, 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 took, we took the slaves British people and American and the Africans took the slaves to not the Africans, but the Africans were involved in it. Took the slaves to uh, to to do the cotton picking and 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 to the to do the um, uh, the, the farm work in in the in the Caribbean and the tobacco planting and all that sort of stuff. We don't have the, the number of slaves in this in the in the the slaves were exported out of the UK. They didn't come to the UK. So there's, there's, that's how I see it. So less, yeah. uh, less apartheid, no apartheid. Uh, sorry, it, it, cultural apartheid, geographical, economic apartheid, but no legal apartheid. Mm -hmm. And the fact that m most people are not descendants mm -hmm. of slaves in the, mm -hmm. I would say. So it's less. It, it seems less of a thing here. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so I was, yes. So of, of course, a nation is affected by the history of 
how people have arrived and been brought and stolen and their connections to that. And that's true then in terms of how white people there understand people of color, um, et cetera. I would say though, having been, you know, like I don't live in um, the UK or in Europe anywhere, but I would say as a black person who has grew up in the North of the United States, I don't experience much difference um, going in the North, you know, like being in Wisconsin and white people there and the kind of dissociation that white people have in the North from the South. There weren't slave, you know, their slavery wasn't a part of our North America and Northern states as much. Okay. Um, and yet uh, there's still racism, still separation. People still live separately. The people are still racist. People still have a white supremacist understanding about who's smarter, who's more trustworthy, what's normal, what's unusual, et cetera. And I would equate it to not much different than um, that kind of dissociation that happens in the between northern uh, US and southern US that oh slavery happened down there that's yeah. that's those white people, you know, like we didn't have slavery up here. And the way that racism then manifests in that kind of psychology to then what happens in Canada and where ca Canadians say oh we're not you know like it's different, you know, and then the same as in the UK where it's like oh it wasn't here yeah. and so it's true that that is different, you know. And yet, from a person of color's perspective, it still kind of plays out the same in modern day. You know, kind okay. of modern day. You know, like in modern day, the U.S. we don't have slavery, but you know, where I live is pretty much ninety percent black. I could choose to live anywhere I want, you know, here because of my income, but I still get treated like crap. People still follow me around in grocery stores. And the same thing happens when I'm in the UK. I still see the same kind of division of class and status and um, a level of cluelessness of white people about you know racism and curiosities about what it's like. The conversations I have are very similar with my very well-educated colleagues in the UK um, with my very well-educated colleagues in the US. And so I think, yes, there's differences and yet the lived experience of race it's a, it's a nuanced thing, you know, that the difference is and the challenges are different. When I talk to transracial adoptees, it's the same, you know, like stuff um, everywhere where they're growing up uh, with their white parents. Um, so it's like yes and no, you know, yes and no, it's different. And I think the differences don't aren't so stark that they purchase us out of uh, serious conversations about white accountability and white privilege, those things are the same. That you know, like in the UK, there's still white privilege. In the US, there's still white privilege. There's skin tone privilege. There's um, the same histories of transracial adoption in the UK around light skin and mixed race. I think what is different in, in the UK is that you have a much smaller population of black people. So the liberation movements, the civil rights movements, the all that, there's there's a lower number of black people, you know, to be able to really launch things and there's less integration of spaces because you don't have the same hugeness of population of black people um, there and you have a, a large immigrant black population and that's very different and so here in the US, we have folks who are here because of slavery, which is a very different psychology of blackness and black Americanness than black Africans black Jamaicans black. Uh, Afro Latinos, you know, who are coming as immigrants with, you know, like by choice in some ways, even though they may not have chosen to be in Jamaica because of the slave trade there or in Guyana because of slave trade there or Puerto Rico, which is a, another layer of um, within the US, but also um, a distinct island um, <clears throat> and, and citizenship status. Um, so there's, there's layers to the um, black population in the US that are both immigrant populations and then slave uh, population that causes our black population to be both really big and also very diverse in a way that's not quite the same in the UK. So I think all of those things, of course, matter for what it's like to be a black person and what it's like to be a white person there and what it's like to be uh, South Asian or Muslim or anything else in the UK. I think you guys have a different kind of racism that falls upon Indian folks there that um, is different um, 
though similar in the US. So I, I sort of feel like, yes, I wanna honor those differences. Um, and then also I wanna honor how in the end, whiteness still is, is supreme. <laughs> and um, in the end of the day, that is the thing that then drives how everybody else has to fall in and cope that makes it wildly similar um, for those of us who um, don't identify as, as white for whatever pathway that brings us to that conversation. I think for for me the and like because of your your day job, right? Um, and I, I did, wish I hadn't I hadn't mentioned that. So you're a professor, right? Yes, guilty as charged. You're a professor, and it, it, is it cultural studies? I, I sorry, I can't remember. So I'm a social work professor. Social work. So yeah. I was a social worker in child welfare for a period of time, and I am now a social work professor at um, the University of Chicago at the School of Social Work there. And then I also, my other part of my day job is I'm the faculty director at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. Okay. So um, for me, there's, there's, you, there's two, the, although the layer cake is uh, artificial and the smoothie is far more, but look, a, a different way, far more accurate way of looking at an individual. It would seem to me that the, the, the trauma due to uh, loss of a, a, a birth mum is very different to the trauma of institutionalized racism, should we say, mm. or, um, or the trauma of, of racism, because, well, it, it seems to me they, they would seem to be different things. Mm -hmm. So no amount of um, no amount of therapy, for example. Mm -hmm. So 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 it, like, look at someone like me, white guy, white adopted parents, white birth parents, white adopted parents. I've got the uh, I've so if I've got this trauma, if I've got this primal wound right, then I'm going to have to go to some therapy, and I'm going to and I'm hopefully going to come to terms with it. I'm going to do some healing. Right, it's an, an, an it's an internal job. Um, the if, if we look at the, the the trauma to do with r racism, it it seems no no amount of therapy is gonna, <laughs> gonna fix that, right? Well, I don't I don't know. Okay, so I just have to say I'm not sure. I want to answer it that way. <laughs> you know, I'm like not sure. I'm not okay. sure. I I want to challenge that. Um, Good. That something like the loss of your connection to your origins is ever truly healed. Um, just uh, and, and what that really means when you say that, like, I, I think when sometimes when we talk about trauma and healing, we assume that these are like these phases where you ever get to a place where you undo it like it never happened, you know, and that this is partly why I have found the language of ambiguous loss to be so helpful for me, because it helps to sort of everyone to to realize that there are aspects of loss that are tied to adoption. That um, are things that you don't undo or make pretend that like they didn't happen and that the healing is about getting to some place where it's like you were never adopted or it's like you're not black or it's like you're not transracially adopted and all those things in that way are the same to me you learn to live with them you learn to carry these things and there and we live in a society when i say we i mean I really mean like the global international we. We live in a society where biological origins across most cultures are seen to be so important. And that doesn't matter whether you're white or black or whatever, that like your origins, um, your beginnings, where you come from, who your people are, um, are understood to be carried in your blood. And no matter science telling us that that is not true, <laughs> there's no magic in blood that allows you to feel closer to people for whom you share genetics than for people you do not. There's still a cultural ethos in the world that prioritizes those kinds of relationships as the most sacred, the most pristine, the most true, the most authentic. And I think those are things that uh, adopted people 
live with culturally all the time being told you know that that that's the most amazing thing that you can do is give birth to a child women live with this constant cultural ethos of the most pure way to be a female is to produce a child and that that is when you actually access um your 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 purpose and your this amazing kind of love that you will never experience in any other way in any other form and so i think that's a kind of assault that adopted people live with all the time um, in our society in the same way that those of us who live with racism who were being told that the only pure way you can be a human being is to be white or the only way that you can fully be you know whatever is in white form whatever that may mean and those things are very similar and assault our our degrees of humanity in different ways definitely but in the same sort of never ending <laughs> assault from outside in all the time. Now, I do think that there's an added layer for those of us who are both adopted and people of color, but um, I think there is um, in the same ways that I would like to believe that we can get to a world where we don't do this to adopted people, where we don't make people have to just have one parent at a time <laughs> and that we can get outside of needing to terminate parental rights and that we can live in these more fluid ways where maybe the mother that birthed you isn't the mother that raised you, but that you don't have to be disconnected from these people um, in that way. And I also like to believe that we can get outside of white supremacy and white people can give up their seat at the table as the as the most you know pure form of humanity so that there can be multiple forms of humanity. Um, then I do think that there are ways that we can heal, but I think it requires the same mammoth lift <laughs> to get out of biocentric understandings of family as it does to get out of racist understandings of people that the categories that white people have made up as though they are hierarchies are fabrications and they don't mean anything and, and we choose to have them mean things um, and they have, have taken on meaning in really life or death ways but that these things were created by human beings and we can uncreate these things um, and choose something different. And I don't know that I'm gonna ever see that in my lifetime. And then until we do that, I think it's really important for us to recognize the power that they hold in our everyday life as to where we live and who gets jobs and who gets healthcare and who lives or dies and all of these things. It's very, very racialized. But um, I, I think as people of color, we somehow have to learn how do we live a life when racism isn't going anywhere and i just refuse to you know sort of surrender to like i'm just going to live this shitty life because somebody else has decided i'm a third person um, but that doesn't mean that i'm also not going to recognize or that part of my being able to thrive doesn't require that i recognize and see racism as wildly real and have my eyes open, but I've had to do that also with my adoption stuff, you know, and people be like, oh, Gina, do you know your real mom or, you know, all the things that happen all the time and you don't get to some magical age or place in therapy where that stops. You just get to a place where maybe you get better at having a more slick back and letting that slick off a little quicker or that you get better at the smart retorts that you might um, levy to people who you know are asking those questions and racism is the same way that you you know you don't get to a place where you go to enough therapy and you're not hurt anymore by the things that people do or say you just get to a place hopefully that you get a little better at being able to navigate that so that it doesn't get to your core all the time, every time when somebody says or does something and you don't become obsessed at trying to figure out, was that racist? Was that, did somebody, you know, did somebody, cause you can't, you can't ever know, you, you can't ever know. And so you get better at navigating the reality of the world that we, we live in. And I would argue that no therapy does that to a perfect degree with adopted people. We have to learn how to live in a world that organizes itself in a hierarchy that will continue to place um, biological family formations, uh, heterosexual family formations, same race family formations as the best, as the most problem free, even though we all live in ways that we know that that's not true. We all have to kind of navigate that forever. And hopefully as adopted people, we get better at doing that and we can support each other in living in that way. And those of us who are older can support younger people um, 
And I, I just don't see it as any different than racism. I, you know, I have to live in this world and I have to find joy in it and I have to find a life and build a life and um, not allow other people's um, ideas about me to be so consuming that um, I surrender to it and just say, yeah, it's a sucky world and there's nothing I can do. And also not live like eyes closed and ears shut and blah, 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 I can't hear you in some state of denial, which also is, is false. So from a, like a personal um, perspective, rather than an institutional one or a cultural one, um, what has helped you live this stuff better, be less triggered, shall we say, mm -hmm. um, have less things trigger you? What is it that you've learned that has helped you? Mm -hmm. um, I think to just be a little brave to be honest <laughs> um and to to seek the inf to seek information to not be afraid to know um and to not feel like um you know, like I answered that question earlier, you know, like, I'm not sure <laughs> like to, to not feel like I have to have it all figured out before I take a step forward. Um, to be really, really confident about who I am. I think this is something I, I, when I look back now, I think this is something I just was a little bit born with in terms of stubbornness of just not needing, I, you know, I didn't have the benefit of having a lot of windows or, you know, mirrors, you know, I, I didn't have this benefit of being able to have access to people who looked like me, who had lived my weird life and my weird family configuration. And I had to take a step forward with a hunch <laughs> and uh, uh, like, okay, I don't want that. I, that doesn't sound right. And I had, I had to kind of step forward without certainty. And I think that's scary to do as a little kid, but now as an adult, that's provided incredible confidence to not feel like I have to have 100% certainty or even like 50% certainty and to trust myself and who I am in ways that do and don't have anything to do with race and do and don't have anything to do with adoption and to be clear about who I am and to get confident about, you know, when people say, oh, Gina, you know, that's your black coming out or, oh, Gina, that's your white coming out. You know, like I, I no longer am ashamed that I understand different breeds of cows and I know what Ludafist is and I can make a really mean kind of, you know, whatever of Swedish tea cake. Um, and then I also make a really mean sweet potato pie and I know how to make greens and, um, and all of those things and that those are all me and that other people will racialize those things and other people may, that may make people feel uncertain and insecure and um, that's their work to do. And I don't do that intentionally but that it's, it's really required me trusting myself and who I am and being confident in that um, as I make decisions and not needing um, the approval of other people. But that's very hard to do as a little kid. And so I don't wanna give the impression that somehow, you know, that was easy or that I just you know, went, went forward boldly and just did it anyway. Like that, that's not what I'm saying at all. And I, um, and there were a lot of moments of sadness and loneliness and by myselfness and um, and it's continued to be like I don't I don't there aren't a lot of spaces that I walk into where I'm like, yes, this is this, these are my people. And so I guess the other thing that I would say is that I've gotten good at recognizing that that um, in my friendships and in the things that I do to be able to take from those friendships pieces. And that there aren't going to be people that I don't expect people to be the whole of me, you know, like I that I come to friendships and that I come to situations being able to take from them and experience with them pieces and that that's that's okay like that there it's very rare to find people where all parts of your life they understand you, you know, or all everything, you know, and that and that that's actually for me that I found that to be unreasonable expectation to have of people and of places that um, I can, you know, show up to a thing or to a friendship or to a person and find a place of connection 
with them that is valid and meaningful and important and beautiful and healing. And there might be other parts of me and of them I don't understand or that they don't understand that because of that connection that I have with them, I might be willing to share with them this other piece that they're going to be like, what? I don't, I don't get. And because there is that doesn't ruin them. You know, it doesn't mean that I can't be friends with them or this other piece isn't real. And I, and that's been really important. I think as a young kid, I used to cope by imagining this perfect place and these perfect people that I would get to somewhere where all parts of me would be understood and find a home. And I, and I, while that's a lovely image and I, you know, I have a wonderful imagination, um, that has been a, that's been something I've had to let go of and instead kind of meet people on their own terms and let them meet me on my terms and not be so disappointed or crushed when I find some part of them doesn't understand some part of me or some part of me doesn't understand some part of them and that I have to then toss them away and find some other perfect person that I can trust. And so that's required me to trust that, um, who I am is okay, even if it's not fully reflected in somebody else that I that I love or that I care about. And I guess the last piece is that, you know, it's up to me to make these places, you know, that there isn't some perfect thing out there that I that it's that I have it in me to make my home a place that reflects all these different pieces that might make no sense to other people, but is my smoothie or my layer cake or my whatever. Um, and that it's going to change and next year what I might like it might be a little different and that doesn't mean today I'm confused and I don't know who I am it means that I've grown. Um, and I and I'm in a in a place where now I'm really confident about that that's that's great and I found that that also gives other people permission to be their you know jumbled contradictory self. Um, and and that's been really important this place making. Um, thing. And when I look back, that's been a part of all along, you know, like when I would go camping or Girl Scout camping, I would, the first thing I would do is set up my place and pick flowers and make it my house. And so I've always sort of been doing that. And I am much more conscious now about doing that um, and not being worried about how other people are going to experience that or read that, um, but that it makes me feel it's for me <laughs> and other people are welcome to like it or dislike it and those have all been really important things and I just think those are going to be things i'm going to have to continue to do for the rest of of my life it's part of my wellness. Um, practice and I know there are going to be things that come up I don't feel that i'm done or perfect or that there's not something that's going to happen tomorrow that can bring me to my knees and be like wow I I thought I dealt with this a little bit better, you know, and I think that helps also knowing that I'm not like it's not done it's not done that I and so then the fall isn't quite so far because I didn't build myself up to think that I am beyond reproach or that I'm healed fully or that I you know like I'm healing I'm in a process of thriving that these are verbs and practices that I do and the fall hopefully won't be as big as it could have been if this happened when I was 10 or something I like to think that I'm a little stronger now but that um I'm not I'm not beyond harm and I'm not beyond hurt and I'm not beyond things um manifesting in a different way that kind of like huh wow I kind of that caught my breath a little bit I'm gonna have to I going to have to recognize that but but that part of the healing part is recognizing that and like admitting that and 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 saying that out loud so that people don't think, wow, Gina, you seem like you're so together. And it's like, well, today I, I am together and I'm experiencing something that's hurting a little bit. And I need to need a little bit of time or I need to talk about that or I need to do what I what I do. Can I take you back to the you're talking about? I think you not finding everything in one person. Would that be? Mm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. is, is that like a, kind of as, as some of can you give me a, a, an example of that? I'm a, I'm yeah, a I think I think that was a big, um, I don't, you know, like I think it could, I could easily attribute this to, to being adopted to a, sort of an all or nothing or to anyone who's experienced trauma, um, that it's really easy to do what we would call splitting, where, you know, somebody's really great until they're not. And in order to protect yourself, you kind of divorce them out. And you're like, you know, or you or you come to a relationship from a place of waiting to see, you know, like, when are they going to do the thing? When are they going to do that thing? And that you don't trust them or open your heart until they do. And then it's very easy 
to let them go. And I think for those of us who have been adopted, that can be uh, an emotional way that we come to relationships where we're all in, you know, and the person's really great. And it's like, you want to go right to the 10, level 10, you know, and then they do something. And after you've experienced that hurt, the abandonment issues can partner with that experience. That is very normal part of anybody's growing up, but that we can um, overcompensate and overprotect by cutting off really quickly and very severely. And it certainly was then layered for me and my own life on top of then race situations. So I would, you know, find myself in these friendships with my white friends, and then they would say or do something racist. And I would be like, damn, like, or they'd, they'd pull me out and say, well, Gina, we're not talking about you. We're talking about those people. And I'm like, but I am those people, you know? And um, over time, that caused me to look at every white person like, okay, it's just a matter of time before you say this, and I'm just not going to trust you anymore at all. And of course, that does happen because, you know, that that at, at any point people are going to say something or people are going to ask a question, and there it is. I'm like, okay, there we are. Here we are in this in this moment. And so um, that caused me a lot of. Um, hurt because I would I had come to these relationships thinking that um, my friends had heard what I had said when I come to them and hurt you know about the racist thing that I had experienced or how difficult that was for a boyfriend or a, a potential boyfriend to say that they could never date me because I was black or you know it wasn't that I wasn't being open about these things and so I would hear that and think like what have you been doing like how have you have not been hearing me and it hurt a lot. Um, and I think, you know, I, I had then carried that on into relationships with boys that I had had or girlfriends that I had of, you know, like, how could you not understand all of me and these expectations that I had of people um, to really um, be what I needed them to be and realizing that my needs for them were kind of balling up all of these needs, you know, like all my adoption needs and my lost connections to uh, a racial and cultural community needs and, you know, all of these needs that were um, beyond expectation for any one person and that I certainly wasn't fulfilling for them. <laughs> like if I was held to those sort of standards, I probably would have fallen short. Um, and so it took me probably until, I don't know, I was in my 20s um, and really having to think about, you know, like I, I wasn't married yet and I thought I was going to be married and I wasn't a parent yet and I thought I had been, would be a parent by then to kind of be like, okay, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, like, yes, Gina, your imaginings of relationships, they're beautiful. It's, it would be lovely to find this kind of guy. It would be lovely to have this version of best girlfriend. It would be lovely to have this version of life. But like, is that even real? Like, is that, you know, like, I realize you want that. Like, that's real. The wanting is real. Um, and how you would feel is probably real. But people are human. Like, is that realistic? And like, is, is somebody is it is it a good thing to cut off from somebody where you actually did have fun with them um and might you just need to um, recognize that nobody's going to be perfect like that and that yeah some people aren't going to be some white people aren't going to be worthy of you know your deepest pain and hurt around race and okay but might they be good to watch a movie with sometime or might they be good to bike with once in a while and who knows out of that kind of a friendship might they someday be worthy of that kind of a, a relationship or not but um that the second their whiteness shows up um you know how can you protect yourself in a way that doesn't allow them so such deep access you know how, how do you have friendships with people of color that have your experience where you don't feel undermined because it's just like yours you know and so i just think there was a lot of work that i had to do that um, I would say is more tied to both being a person of color in great proximity to white people um, and the, the harm that comes from that and what, what you have to do as a little kid to be able to access friendships, et cetera, in that kind of a space. And then also paired in a really insidious way with being adopted and having a, a disconnection from a person and family where the, our society says that's the unbreakable bond like that's the person who's going to get you 
and realizing that probably my own white biological mother would not have gotten me in that way, you know, and kind of just having to sit back and say, okay, this is the reality of your life. And it does make you unique and um, distinct. And it means that probably most people of any race are not going to understand fully your experience. And that um, as an adult, I'm going to have to make it my responsibility to find people who I can have connections with that are growth fostering and healing, but they may not be able to heal all parts of me. It may just be this relationship is going to be really critical in a very particular way. And I have to honor that and not expect that that person's going to be my everything. And when they can't be, I'm probably not going to be their everything, you know, like I'm not that either. And so I think also a little bit of humility, like Gina, you know, you also are not going to be a person's everything. And that doesn't mean that you're going to live by yourself in a little shoebox somewhere, you know, and that you can't have valid and authentic relationships that are real. It just means that, you know, people are, we're all flawed and we're all limited and we're all, you know, caught up in our own experiences and nobody lives our life. And that doesn't mean that you're alone. Um, but that took a lot of, a lot of work and also grief to let go of this idea that there was this place or this family setting or this person or this guy or this best friend that was going to be that. You know, and just really like being honest with myself of like, okay, Gina, and you're not settling. And it doesn't mean that you're like, re, you know, like letting go of that. That's a fantasy <laughs> that I had created and letting go of that. And that, that, that emo emotional maturity um, came very slow for me and over a course of many, many years. And it's still, there's still a part of me that goes back there like, oh, but wouldn't that be great though? Like, wouldn't that be, like, wouldn't that be great? And then I have to say, no, 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 that's a, actually, that's a, a poison. That's not a, no, it wouldn't be because it's not real. <laughs> it's not real. Yeah. So it took, um, it, it came slowly. There, there were no kind of. <clears throat> no, epiphanies. It's, it's no of, I wish I could say, you know, like to people that might listen to this, like read these three books, go to therapy for a year. And like, no, this is a lifelong thing. And that thing is still, it's like an addiction, you know, it's like, it's like I still am addicted to this maybe idea that there is this perfect utopia, some, something, something. And I, and that was a really important coping mechanism for me as a little child, you know, to allow me escape, um, uh, to have me believe that there was something better. And so I don't want to pathologize it because there's aspects of it that that did get me out of, you know, like it allows you to see something better when what's before you is pretty shitty. And so I, I, I think there were moments in my life where I, I needed that. And that was really important to have that belief. Like I just believed it in this world. And there are parts of that that came true. Like my, a lot of my life now was only made possible because I believed that there was something bigger and better out there than what I was leaving, living. And some aspects of those things I am now living. So it, it, it's important, you know, like I had just have a different relationship to it now than I did as a child. And I realized that parts of those imaginings live in parts in people and places and things, but they are not all within a single. They are, they just, you know, like I found homes for them in different relationships and in different spaces, but that I'll have to, that, you know, like the, part one is kind of here and I allow that to be real. And these other parts may not get as fed. Um, until I go to other spaces and places. And every once in a while, I have these moments where, you know, they kind of come together and it's great. Um, but it's a kind of, it's not that it goes away for me. It's not that it went away. It's just that I stopped um, searching for it and I started building it in relationships and people, but also recognizing that those are parts. Yeah. Well, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i was i'm back i'm back to the smoothie and the and, and the and the cake thing you know yeah. I, I, I was actually uh i was in the states last last week and they they gave me um i, I went uh, i was at a, a it was a family a, a family care center so it's for mums and mums and kids that okay to, to to live and uh on um on this uh on on this like campus which is a children's home they've got okay. a, a room and they've got they've got uh, one building which is for what they call family care. 
and you know they gave me uh we had dinner and it was it was in one of those trays mm. where you've got little different compartments everything segmented <laughs> yeah so they gave me that and, and, and what do you want and and it's like this this i've never seen it I, i've never had dinner. oh really you didn't it, see those like little yeah, yeah. I, i'm used to having a plate right and you know <laughs> And it, so it's it's all in one, right? Yes. <laughs> all these little, little like, veggie sections and yeah, little dessert section, section, you know. and, and, meat section. And, and, and my sister used to eat, you know, if you had, so so you have some fries, yeah. some fish cakes and some peas. Yeah. She would separate. eat each one individually, right? Where I would eat, you know, I'd have a bit of fish cake um, and, a, and a bit of fry, maybe, or a bit of... You know, yes. I'd be mixing it up and she would yeah. go around the around the around the play um and uh you know i i guess it's just like it, it seemed really weird uh, it seems really <laughs> weird that's an old comment uh but not as weird you you talked about sweet potato pie so we went to this um restaurant um and there was it was sunday lunchtime and there was a guy uh, no woman actually carving um, carving some beef I thought okay. this beef looks fantastic so went up there got some beef yeah. then I went round to the you know the the little stand where the hot lights and they've got all the different things in, mm -hmm. and they had some sweet potato um, there's some sweet potatoes there with marshmallows on the top oh yeah uh -huh. and I had like a, this was in I was in um, uh, where was I I was in South Carolina in, okay Green, Greenwood, South Carolina, and I had this real visceral reaction to, really? to these marshmallows on like, top of the sweet potatoes. Just, like that would. That, it's that, just and, like and sacrilegious. Suppose, that's what. Sacrilegious. Sacrilegious. Um, just plain wrong. Yeah. Just plain wrong. <laughs> and, and, and then I, you know, I spoke to her, and I'm, 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 I'm explaining, I'm explaining, you know, exclaiming, I'm explaining all this to to the, um, the Americans that I'm, I'm with, and and they, well, that's the way it is, you know. And I said, well, you know, no. and then I had got onto the, you know, doing a, a WhatsApp call with my wife. You, you can't believe what they have. Marshmallows on marshmallows, sweet potatoes, sweet ah. potato together. Ah. And it it was it was really visceral. And then I thought, what what I, I you know why am I getting? I seem to be yeah. What is this was, about? Like in yeah, me? Yeah. This what is all? I, I'm like uh, we watch um, we watch a lot of American shows on on telly, and one of the shows that we watch is uh, is is Blue Bloods, which is about a oh. cop family with yeah. Tom Spell, right? And 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 the way they hold their knives and forks. Is it weird too? It, Strange. It's really weird, and also it's like a, a a visceral reaction. And but like everybody's normal is different. Yes, everybody's normal is different. Yep, it's totally true. And you know, it, where where I so my understanding of the marshmallows is that's what white people do. So okay. um, depending regionally on where you are. Even in the U.S., you would have people visceral, like, why the hell would you put marshmallows on sweet potatoes? But it's, I think it is true. And as I was listening, you didn't say this, but as you were listening or as you were talking to me about your experience here and the segmented tray of, you know, food touching and then your sister compartmentalizing food and you eating it all at once. I was thinking about our, our cake, our layer cake and smoothie metaphor and kind of also how you've been asking me these questions about, you know, like what's your experience versus what's this kind of outside experience. It's sort of like how you take in the world could be segmented, you know, so how I take and grab, but once it goes in, it it's the smoothie. <laughs> it all just, you know, it all gets jumbled up so that, you know, like I could, whether I separate out eating my, you know, mash and peas in different, you know, yeah, like different so kind good. of segments, I, I may need to take them in differently. I may need to take them in in a, a whole, like, this is all my mash. I just want it all here. Or I might want mash and, and bangers, you know, or whatever it is to, together. But once I take it in, it's all in there. It's all in there and it's all mushed in and it's it not is. separate at all. Um, and that's no why your 
metaphor is far better. Well, but it's, I would say maybe not better, but it, um, more accurate. we need it all. Like, you know, like it exists in the world sometimes separate out there. Sometimes it's not in the smoothie form um, out in the world. And so it's sort of like we get it in these different directions. And then the process of what happens inside is the smoothie maybe. <laughs> but I would say also sometimes people keep it separate. <laughs> sometimes people, you know, like people will, like I've seen people cope in ways where they work very hard to keep it separate. For me, that would be very hard. I, I, I wouldn't, that would be very hard for me to do that. But I'm open to the possibility that for other people, that may be really important for a period of time or in a moment or whatever. So I I really resist the ideas of like, maybe mine is better and yours is not. Like, I, I feel like whatever works for you, where you are in your moment to be more healthy, whatever pushes you to, to think of it in a different way that might be useful, I think is the right way at this time and space and moment. Um, but I, but I, do, I, I wanna kind of, I think the more metaphors that we can use to sort of enter into a meaningful conversation with each other and then think through, I, I think that's the, the best. And so I'm all for many metaphors so that we can kind of think about it critically and use it to challenge ourselves and others and use, them to be able to be in dialogue with one another to understand as deeply as we can our different experiences in this same world. So then, uh, I would say to that um, that the the metaphor that best I think best uh, sums up who where we are. Um, how we feel, what we think, what the world looks like, is the fact that um, our feelings are an inside job. They come from within us, right? So feelings, feelings come from thoughts, like juice comes from fruit. Okay? And we're obsessed in the West with our feelings and our thoughts. <laughs> but we aren't our feelings and we aren't our thoughts. We are the, the, we are the juicer. We are, we are the juicer. And, um, we, uh, and we lose sight of that completely because we're so caught up in our feelings. We're so caught up in our thoughts. We're, we're so, so, so much trying to change our thoughts, to change the way we feel or change the way the world, because we think that if we change the world, it's going to change the way we feel. Um, it doesn't work like that. It, it, there, it's, an, it's an inside job, and we, we need to go upstream of our feelings, up, upstream of the world to our feelings, upstream of our world to the thoughts, and upstream to who we truly are, because um, whether... whether um, And this is what I do in schools, on elementary schools. Um, the, uh, the 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 traumatized tangerine, right, um, doesn't affect the juicer. It only affects the juice that comes out of the juice. Mm. Okay, I would argue the traumatized tangerine might break that juicer. <laughs> okay, so I would argue that it actually does. And how I've come to think about your upstream thing is also to get outside of, in addition to, I agree that um, in Western society, we're very obsessed with the self and our feelings and our thoughts and our identities. And so I would even argue an importance of considering getting outside of ourselves altogether and thinking about collective and thinking about our community and thinking about each other um, and that I would argue none of this is separate. Um, how I've come to think about these things is that they're all mutually reinforcing. Um, and that uh, and that, that tangerine, if left un, undone, if you've ever left a piece of fruit out on the counter forever, after it gets moldy and nasty, it gets real hard, real hard and dried up and like a rock. And you put that thing into a juicer 
and it's going to mess with that juicer in a real big way. And so that we all do affect each other. And this idea that we control our thoughts, our feelings, ourselves, maybe a little, you know, like maybe a little, but we also have great effect on one another. And um, the extent to, to which any of anything controls anything, which I am coming increasingly to question very deeply. But I think that doesn't mean that we don't have some choice about, you know, what we do. I, I don't control and choice for me are a little different. Um, and I, I would love to see us get to a place where we see all of these things as just intimately, intimately connected and that my own self healing is dependent on my plugging into other people um, and experiencing other people fully as beings and not being so centered on kind of how I'm feeling about something or how I, you know, like all of that. And not to say that that doesn't matter because it does, um, but that, um, that things aren't separate that we all kind of are a smoothie, even though our experience of that is separate. You know, like my experience of me is very separate. And I, you know, don't think anybody understands, you know, like what I'm feeling and how I'm feeling. And I think I have this whole private world going on inside of myself. And it's maybe really not quite as private as I think. And it's really not as special as I think. And it's really not as unusual as I think. And um, I'm starting to question how useful my undivided attention to self is. Um, and, um, so I'm not sure what I think about all that, but I, those, that's kind of as far as I am with that, that I, I think the bigger I get outside of myself and the more that I focus on the well-being of others and the well-being of my surroundings and the well-being of other things and hearing what people, other people think are their well-beings, knowing they're through the, in the same struggle as I am, <laughs> um, the better I feel. Um, and so I'm kind of, and that's the track I'm on <laughs> right now. I was trying to figure that out and trying to um, invest fully in that and knowing that I'll, I'll learn a lot in that way, but I don't, I don't fully know what I'm doing, but I, I trust the process. And it's, so far it's but served my 50s very well, so. Tip top. Thank you very much for your, thank you very much for your time, Gina. Gina. Um, and um, it's been great talking to you. Yes, likewise. Likewise. Thanks a lot, listeners. Uh, thank you for listening. We'll speak to you again very soon. Cheers. Bye-bye. Very great.